Hey everybody, um, please buy your heads and close your eyes for opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing everybody that has logged in or plans to log in to get here on time, open their hearts to the to the words that the pastor is going to bring to us today. Please help us to internalize it and apply it to our lives. And please continue to work in our lives as you always have and always will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Anthony Anson. I'm a theology major here at Oakwood. And if you, oh, if you wanna check in, skip, get, go to the Oakwood app and Go to the Oakwood app, hit the scan code right there, a little scan code right there, there we go. And scan the QR thing right there. But um, I just wanna welcome everybody. We thank you guys for logging in. And I hope you guys enjoy the message today.
Good morning, family. It's Chaplain Pelleggi here. Um, welcome you to another chapel. I know that many of you are trying to check in right now. So we invite you uh, to do a couple of things. First of all, spread the feed. Um, I know that we said it was Oakwood's Facebook page, but it's actually O-U-O-S-L-M, so Office of Spiritual Life's Facebook page. You can scan that QR code. If you can't scan the QR code, you can actually open up your Oakwood app, scan the QR code with the Oakwood app. So you got to open the Oakwood app, go to the QR scanner, which should be the top left of your screen, and then scan that code right there. And if you can't scan because you're using the same device to watch that you are that you would use to scan, then you can just go into your Oakwood app, click on the events. You'll see Chapel as an event, University Chapel, and there will be a link where you can enter your information in manually. Um, so yeah, that's just a little housekeeping. But please spread the word. Tell your 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 friends to go ahead and jump on because we're about to get in the word, and this is an important word. Um, just so that you all know a little background on me when it comes to preaching. Whenever I go to preach, man, I uh, I go to God. I speak to him. He speaks to me, and I ask him where he wants me to come from. So um, this message that you're about to receive is is from the Lord. I think somebody needs to mute. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and, and get into it. Today's message is entitled Spoiler Alert. Spoiler Alert. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. We ask that you would shower us with it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Spoiler alert. Based on Philippians 4, 6, and 13, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there? Or open up your Bible app so we can look at it together. Philippians chapter four and verse six. No, I'm sorry, four and verse four. I said I put up six, but it's actually four verse four. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, and that's in, with an exclamation point. Let's jump down to 13, 13. The Bible says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, I made the mistake a few weeks ago of watching a movie with my kids. And the reason why I say it was a mistake is, uh, well, let me explain it. Don't judge me. I was watching this movie, and I'm not going to tell you what movie it was. It wasn't a bad movie, but, you know, you got a lot of sensitive Adventists out there. I was watching this movie and it was one that my son loved when he was a kid. Well, a, a much he was a toddler, so he was around five. He loved this movie. This little robot fighting movie, right? He fell in love with the movie. He watched it all the time. And recently they put it up on Netflix. And he hadn't seen it in a long time. So he saw it there on Netflix. He watched it and he fell in love with it all over again. Now, of course, since he was watching it, his sister wanted to watch it. And they were just really excited. So they came to me like, dad, dad, we want to watch this movie. We want to watch this movie with you. I'm like, all right. Now I had seen the movie years ago and, but it was years ago. So there were, I, I remembered uh, the characters. I remember the way the, the, the movie ended, but I did not remember parts of the story. So as you get older, you'll recognize that if there's a movie you've seen and not too many times and years go by, then you'll forget parts of it. So for me, it was almost like a new movie because there were a lot of parts that I did not remember. So I was excited to watch it because, you know, I enjoyed the movie when I first watched it with my son. So I'm sitting there with my kids. I'm watching the movie. First scenes are coming up. I don't really remember much. And it gets to the point where it's the first fight with the robot, right? Um, and I'm just like, I can't remember who's going to win. So I'm, I'm feeling some suspense and I'm enjoying myself. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. And then here goes my daughter. Oh, he's going to win. Spoiler alert. I was tight. You know, uh, I was upset. 
I was I was not happy that she said that. So I start to scold her. I'm like, man, you can't say stuff in the movie like that. She's five, so I can't really get upset like that. But I had to tell her, don't say anything. Don't say anything. I don't remember. My son was talking too, so I had to tell him. So we get to another scene. And before the scene even starts, I'm telling her, don't say a word. I want to, I, I don't know who's going to win. Don't say a word. And my son's chiming in like, yeah, don't say anything. So she doesn't say a word, but she starts doing all this body language and she just can't help herself. And she just spoils it again. I'm just like, man, I hate that. Don't you hate that when you're watching a movie with somebody and and they already saw it and they just can't keep their mouth shut and they're just spoiling it for you. It ruins the whole experience. You don't want to know what happens next in the story. I wish life story was like that though, right? Have you ever been in a situation where you're just waiting for a scene change? I mean, I feel like we're there right now, right? You want, I mean, we've been in this scene for too long now. We're, we're thinking about COVID and all, and the impact that it's had on our lives. And we're just ready for a scene change. It's been difficult on everybody for different reasons. It's been worse for some than others. We're tired of the isolation. We're tired of the way that we have to take our classes. We're tired of not being able to get together the way we used to. We're so tired of this stuff. We're ready for a scene change. We want our situation to change, our circumstance around us to change. And we've been here for a minute. We thought it was gonna be over for a long, you know, a long time ago. We're just tired. But can I say something to you? Just because you're tired doesn't mean you're ready. Just because you're tired doesn't mean you're ready. Let me ask you a question. What if the situation doesn't change? What if we're in this moment for a little while longer? What if things get worse before they get better? What if your situation around you doesn't change? Does that mean that you have to walk around depressed? Does that mean that you have to be hopeless? Does it mean that your happiness is dependent on the next scene change? Does something have to change in your environment in order for things to get better? What if God is using this experience to try to get our attention? What if the same experience that we're seeking deliverance from is the situation that God is trying to use to deliver us? And we're just not getting the point yet. What if God needs to use this experience? And I'd like to suggest, what if God is using COVID to save your soul, to lead us to repentance? What if God is doing that? And when I say lead us to repentance, I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about people who haven't accepted Jesus yet. Because I think about John the Baptist when he came before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus, he called, he called God's children to repentance. And we're living in the last days. And when I read Revelation 3, we referred to it last time. When I read Revelation 3, Jesus is calling Christians to repentance. What if God is using this situation to try to work some stuff out of us? What if he's trying to use this situation to grow us, to strengthen our faith? What if he's going to allow it for a little bit longer? What if your own situation, we're talking about COVID, that's affecting all of us. What about your own situation? What if God is trying to use that to work some things in or to work some things out, to strengthen you, to prepare you for what lies ahead? And we're, and, and we're depressed and we're sad and we're discouraged because we're thinking to ourselves, God, how much longer? But what if God is leaving us in this situation because he needs to allow it in order to get to us? What if he's just trying to get your attention? What if he's trying to develop your devotional life or your prayer life or start one? What if he's just trying to connect with you and there's no other way to get your attention because he's been trying and trying and trying to strengthen us. He's been trying to develop us and we haven't been getting the lesson. What if God just had to turn up the heat so that we would get it? Because if we don't and it's too late, he'll lose us forever. What if? What if God is using this situation? Right. So Paul, the apostle, says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And, and, and it makes me think, like, how can he say that? Right. When you look over his life, it doesn't seem like he had a whole lot to rejoice about. And yet he uses this word several times throughout the Philippians. He uses it about seven times, the word rejoice. 
And then he also uses the word joy about seven times. So it seems like he's super happy, but what does he really have to be happy about? How can he be so joyful? And here's the reason why I asked that question. Look over the life of Paul. He actually talks about it a little bit in, in chapter two of this same letter. And he says, he, he says that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. I want to let you know that early on in his career, before he met Jesus, Paul was a rising star. He was he was um, known amongst the people in, in Jerusalem. He was a leader in the church, and he sat under the feet of one of the most respected leaders in all of, 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 the, um, of the Jewish faith. And so he was being primed. He was being uh, groomed to be a next leader in Israel, and he already was. He was climbing the ladder. He probably had a really nice house and lived in a nicer part of Jerusalem. He was zealous for his faith. And at that time, because Judaism did not agree with Christianity, he began persecuting the, the church. And that was the MO of Judaism at the time. So he was rising based on that. He was known for being a persecutor of the church. And that was boasting, that was boosting his career. And so Paul had a good life. He was climbing the ladder of success. He was probably making good money. He was respected. He had honor. And then he met Jesus and his life went downhill. So why do I say that? His life went downhill after he met Jesus. It starts off with him being struck with blindness. After that, he loses respect in the community. After that, he's on the run. He used to be chasing the church. Now he's being persecuted himself. After that, that his word, his name became a, 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 a punchline. He was disrespected. After that, he started going around preaching all over all over the, the his part of the world. And so he wasn't living in that nice house anymore. He wasn't making the same money that he was anymore. He was on the run. He was being beaten and left for dead. He was being whipped. He was being, I mean, all kinds of stuff. He was being chased out of cities. People didn't like him. He was being thrown in prison. And as he writes this verse, rejoice in the Lord always, he's sitting in prison. So how are you talking about rejoice? and you're sitting in prison. But if Paul can go through this experience and his life got better, even though his life on the outside got worse, then maybe it's not so much about what's going on around us as it is what's going on within us. Hmm. Maybe your situation doesn't need to change. You see, I don't like pain. Nobody does. I don't like suffering. Nobody does. But sometimes it's necessary. Paul's life took a dramatic turn. And if we're looking at it from our perspective, we would have thought he made a mistake. Because he was on the way up and then his life went like this. And yet Paul is saying, I gained everything once I accepted Jesus. You see, we have this expectation that when we come to Jesus, that things are just supposed to magically get better. We want Jesus to change our situation. And when we listen to the popular preachers of the day, especially, you know, and there's some good preachers out there. Don't get me wrong. You know, I like Michael Todd. He can speak. I like Furtrick. You know, he's good, too. I like all of these guys. But I need you all to understand something. Right. We're waiting on a breakthrough when in reality, sometimes we need to get broken down. Right. We have this idea of, of, of God coming through for us and changing our situation. But can I suggest to you that Jesus came and there were some people in bondage, financial bondage. There were some people who were beggars and they were still beggars after Jesus left. Can I suggest to you that the reason why Jesus got crucified is because the Jews were upset that he would not change their situation? He was so focused on what was on the inside, and they were upset because he wouldn't deal with the stuff on the outside. You know, we have these expectations of God when we come to him, and in popular Christianity, it's all about waiting on that breakthrough, and God wants to elevate you. But do you know why? You know, a lot of us are Christians, but you know, different denominations have different theologies. I don't know if you're aware of that, and there are some denominations that believe that believe God is establishing his kingdom here on earth. And so he's elevating his people in status because he's going to come here to elevate 
to elevate to, to establish his kingdom. And so you got the rapture, you have all of these different theologies, and these theologies, which are not consistent with scripture, inform the preaching. And so if I buy into this idea that once I say yes to Jesus, it's just a matter of time before my situation change changes, and then my situation doesn't change, then I'm gonna be like, oh man, I'm out. You told me that this was gonna happen. But can I suggest to you that the, the fact that you come to Jesus isn't necessarily, it does not mean that your situation is gonna change immediately. And it may not change. Things may, aren't going to instantaneously go from bad to better. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. Sometimes I have to stay in a particular situation for a little while, but it's not, necessary. It does not mean that until my situation changes that I have to walk around feeling depressed. Can I suggest to you that Paul was speaking from experience and when he said rejoice from a prison cell, he was actually happy. He's not like Christians who walk around today with a smile on their face and like, hey, how you doing? Oh, God is good. Even though on the inside I'm dying, right? Because I'm dealing with this and I'm dealing with that, but it's almost as if I'm supposed to be happy all the time because I'm a Christian, but deep down inside, I'm hiding feelings of depression. I'm hiding anxiety. I'm, I'm stressed out about this and I'm stressed out about that, but I'm supposed to say that I'm happy and that God is good. And I know that because in my head, that's what I'm supposed to believe. And it is true that he is good, but in my heart, I don't feel that way because he hasn't changed my situation. But Paul was speaking from experience. He wasn't faking it. As a matter of fact, when you look throughout the letter, there were certain things that he was dealing with that would stress you out. First of all, he was in prison. What does he say about that? He was just like, I see this as an opportunity to witness for Jesus, so I'm celebrating. What? He was also facing death, and he talked about the fact that he could die. And he was just like, I don't know which one is better, dying or remaining alive. Because if I die, eventually I'll see Jesus. If I remain alive, then I can keep working for the church. I don't know which one to choose. What? That's crazy. Can I suggest to you that believers are not pessimists, but they're also not optimists? You see, the pessimist sees the, the cup as half empty. They say that the optimist sees it as half full. But if you're a believer and you have strong faith, then you understand that your cup runneth over. You're neither one. Paul saw every opportunity, every experience that he had. He had learned to rejoice in the Lord. How was he able to do that? It's because he had experienced the fact, he had come to know that Jesus is worth rejoicing over. He had come to know Jesus so well that even though he went through all of the stuff of being whipped, of being shipwrecked, of being beaten, even though he went through all of that stuff, he trusted Jesus anyhow. What if God uses these situations because he's trying to develop my, our faith? Because we need it. Because our faith is weak. I know that COVID has been bad and it's been affecting us, but man, we still got three meals a day. It's been rough and some has been harder from others. Some of us has lost, lost loved ones. It's been difficult, but Paul was reflecting here over his life and he didn't see all of these trials and tribulations as reasons to doubt God. And so if God is using these situations in order to build our trust, let me say something to you. The only way to build trust is to remove doubt. And when we look back over our lives, we cannot allow our past to dictate our present. And when we look at our past, there are plenty of reasons to doubt God. Because some of us have gone through some stuff in our recent past. And when we go back further, we've had to deal with some serious trauma, serious trauma. I want to let you know that God takes no pleasure in your pain. And when we look back for some of us who have dealt with things like abuse and, and all kinds of stuff, and I know you cried out to God and you were just like, God, when is this going to end? When is this situation going to change? Where are you right now? Can I suggest to you that he's always been there, that when you were crying out to him all alone, he was crying with you and the devil was right there as well, trying to cause us to doubt God saying, yeah, if God loved you, he wouldn't allow this to happen. 
No fool. If God, God does love me, you're the one that inspired that person to do this to me. So don't come here lying to me saying God doesn't love me when you're the one that caused it. You see, the devil hates us. He hates you. He hates Jesus. And because he hates Jesus and he can't get him anymore, he's he's upset. And what kind of what kind of low down person? You can't get to me, so you get to my children. Yo, you try to come for my son or my daughter. I'm coming for you. But what kind of person would go after a child to get after the parent? That's what the devil does. Let me tell you something. God took no pleasure in that. He was crying with you. And let me say one other thing. God shielded you from the impact that it could have had on you because there are some individuals who have experienced some of the same things that you have, but they're not at Oakwood University right now. Shoot, they're not even in college. God preserved you through that. And that's how you know that he was with you because if you're listening to my voice right now, that means that you are enrolled in a four-year institution and not just any four-year institution, you're at, enrolled at Oakwood University and you're listening to a word from the Lord right now. That means God was with you because he brought you to this point. And I know it was hard and some of us have this deep, pain and there's doubt associated with my with our pain but let me tell you something that same pain that you're walking around with just give it to Jesus and he'll heal you from it it'll take a little bit of time but trust him he does not desire your pain but we can't avoid pain in this life we can't avoid suffering as a matter of fact we need it and you you might be thinking to yourself why why would i need pain chap have you ever heard of this um this medical condition called KIPA, SIPA, I think one of the two, it's an acronym. It stands for congenital insensitivity to pain and androsis. Basically what it means is that you can't feel pain and you can't sweat. Now, maybe as you're listening to that, you'd be like, oh shoot, that's a nice disease to have. I wish I couldn't feel pain. But what would happen to you if you could not feel pain? What is the purpose of pain? The purpose of pain is to let you know that something is wrong. If I broke my foot and I couldn't feel that, then it can develop some gangrene. And if that happens and the infection spreads, I could lose my foot or my leg or I could possibly die. If something was going on with my organs internally, right, and I couldn't feel it, so I didn't go to the doctor to check it out. I wouldn't know until other things started happening or other symptoms started displaying on the external. If I can't feel the pain, then I would never know that something was wrong. And so God, he hates to allow the pain. And when you cry, he cries with you, but he's able to use that pain to strengthen you, to develop your faith. So don't doubt his love for you ever. And so Paul in this passage, when he says rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, He's speaking from personal experience and he's speaking from a position of strong faith. And God wants to develop your faith and my faith, your trust and my trust. And the only way he can do that is by removing the doubt. The only way he can do that is through experience. And God takes all of our experiences, even the bad ones, and uses them to strengthen us and build us up but you can't be built up until you're broken down. So I challenge you to look over your life and start to look at it differently. Don't believe the devil's lie when he says, oh, God wasn't with you. God must not love you. He never heard your prayers. He's the fool that caused all that mess. He's the one that put the ideas in the people's heads to do these things. He's the one that put the idea for the parent to walk away from the family or, 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 or all of the struggle. Everything that we experience terrible in this life is originated by him. And then he tries to blame God. And because we feel so alone, it's easy to believe him. Don't believe him. Do what Paul said, rejoice. And you know, there's a reason why Paul could say that. Reason why he could say that, like I said, it was from experience. But not just that. Not just that, there's more to it. So I said earlier that in popular Christianity today, 
we hear a lot about, you know, these breakthroughs and these turnarounds and how God's going to come through and do all this stuff. And he's going to change my situation. And he's going to elevate me and he's going to do all of that. But what if it doesn't happen? What if he doesn't change the situation? What if I have to stay in the furnace a little bit longer? What if Paul stayed in the furnace, man, his life went to, from bad to worse on the outside. But on the inside, it was a different story. You see, the difference is just a couple of words is versus as right so the thing about what we hear about with jesus and salvation and what he's done for us it has to move from here to here it's kind of like the journey through the wilderness for the israelites they had to come in contact with so many different things it's like god is trying to take a journey from your head to your heart and on the way, he has to go through the wilderness of your experiences and you face stuff left and right. You come into challenges. And when you face those challenges, the temptation is to doubt whether or not God is with you. But you need to trust just like Joshua and Caleb did whenever you face a challenge so that eventually his truth of who he is, his love for you, you never doubt it. Despite what you come in contact with, you don't doubt it. We're living in the last days, fam. The last days. God is trying to strengthen and develop our faith so that we're able to deal with whatever comes our way. So that if our situation goes from bad to worse, we won't doubt him. We'll keep trusting him. But the only way he can do that is through experience. So there's a couple of words that need to change. It needs to go from is to as. Yeah, I know Jesus is our savior, but I need to know Jesus as my savior. I know that Jesus is a deliverer, but I need to know Jesus as my deliverer. I know that Jesus is my provider, but I need to come to know him as my provider. I know that Jesus is a strong tower, but he needs to become my strong tower. That's what happened with Paul. Paul knew that Jesus was his strong tower. Paul knew that he was there always, despite what he went through. And so, Let's move on to that next verse. Paul spoke from experience. He said rejoice because he was actually happy despite his circumstance, because he understood that regardless of what I go through down here, it doesn't change the reality of what Jesus has done up there. His faith informed his experience and not the other way around. You see, a lot of us, because we don't spend time in the word or spend time with Jesus, what ends up happening is we allow our past to dictate our present. And if our past continues to dictate our present, it will affect our future. Right? That's not what Paul did. He didn't get so caught up in what was going around him, despite how bad it was, because he focused on what Jesus had done. He focused on his future glory. He knew what was coming next. Spoiler alert. He knew what was around the corner. And that despite what may go down in this earth, in this life, it cannot change the fact that as long as I keep holding on to Jesus, and I don't even have to be perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. He admitted it in the same letter. You don't even have to be perfect. Just hold on. As long as we hold on to him in faith and don't doubt his love for us, as long as we keep looking to Jesus, despite how bad things get, then I know glory is coming. And that's what the devil does. He tries to stir things up all around you and then use those experiences to try to convince you that God doesn't love you, to try to convince you that you can't make it. He tries to use your own shortcomings and your failures as a Christian. And then he points to how poorly you're performing or to the fact that you haven't had devotion in weeks or that you don't have a strong prayer life. And he tries to discourage you. Keep looking to Jesus. I don't care if the last time you prayed was last year. Talk to him today. Start a conversation right now. Make it a point to connect with him because guess what? Jesus will take you back at any point, regardless of what you've done. And you just hold on to him. Don't look at your external circumstances as an indication that God is not with you. You can be broke. God is with you. You can be rich. God is with you. He is with you through every circumstance. So on that note, let's look at that next verse in 413. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. I remember that verse and most of us do. But one of the reasons I remember that verse is because I remember when Steph Curry came on the scene, man, that he's still, you know, we'll see what happens now that he's coming off his injury next season. 
But you remember when he first came out, he took the lead by storm. He was shooting threes from everywhere, half court, you name it. He was doing it. He was shooting from like 40 feet and sinking all these threes. But you remember one of the things that made him famous is that rather than go with a Nike deal, he went with Under Armour. And I don't know if you know this, but his first pair of sneakers, he had 413 on there. That stood for Philippians 413. And so, you know, we see that verse and that's kind of the way we interpret it nowadays. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He became a two-time MVP. He won finals and all that good stuff. And of course, because he's in the NBA, he's a millionaire. He's getting all these endorsement deals and he's making it big. And so when you start to associate that verse with what Steph Curry did, then we end up interpreting that verse like, like, oh yeah, I can do all things through Christ. I can become whoever I want to be. I can make all kinds of money. But can I suggest something to you about faith, right? It's not to say that you, can, you can't do all things through Christ. No, I just want to suggest something about faith. Faith isn't just believing that God has the ability to do something. Faith is trusting and it's, and it's associated with God's will. Faith is knowing that God's will for your life will come to fruition. It's not so much about me bringing my desires before God so he can co-sign them. No, it's about me accepting his plan for my life. And as I know his will for me, then when I face challenges on the path that he has ordained for my feet, when I face challenges in a situation like that, then I know that God's gonna work it out because I'm walking in his will. You see, faith has to be associated with God's will. It's not about saying, oh, I know God. God's not a genie in the bottle, fam. He's not. He doesn't give us everything that we want because some of the things that we want, we don't need. You see, there's this big idea, and we talked about it a couple of times already in popular Christianity. We look at these certain things as blessings. Is it a blessing really though? God's not a genie in the bottle. Let's be real. Let's be real. And I'll be the first one to be honest. <laughs> if, 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 if Aladdin came to life, you know what I'm saying? And there was such thing as a, a, as a genie in the bottle and you can make a few wishes. Don't sit here and lie. You know, one of those wishes would be for all kinds of money. I'd be like, yeah, let me get 50 billion. But what would happen after that? First of all, as soon as I got that money, I started typing my resignation letter like, peace, I'm out. <laughs> love y'all but yeah you know and i don't know few people that wouldn't struggle with that temptation and i love you dr pollard but you know you might be typing there too like i love serving this institution but uh so everybody would struggle with that temptation the truth is that there are certain things that god does not give us and i'll be real i'm, I'm gonna be real there was a certain time where my life was so in shambles that i was just like yo god let me get that lottery real quick though <laughs> I just wanted that money because my situation was so bad. I was I couldn't keep up with my bills. I'm getting calls all day from debt collectors. And look, enjoy your college years, man, because once you get out into adulthood, you know, life gets real. I mean, life was real for me. And I was just like, God, I know you got the power to do it. Let me just get these numbers real quick. Well, obviously, I never got them because I'm here right now. Praise the Lord. But what if I did? What if there are certain things that we're chasing after? that we think would be a blessing, but then after we receive it, rather than be drawn closer to God, it draws us away from him. If that's the case, then sometimes a promotion isn't necessarily a blessing. Sometimes a big figure salary isn't necessarily a blessing. Don't follow the money. The money may not be the blessing. That might not be coming from God's hand. Maybe the devil is trying to use that to lead you away from God. And what good is it if a man profits the whole world but loses his soul? So you see this verse where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The reason why we misinterpret it is because of what comes right before it. Paul says, look, I've been all over the place. He's reflecting on his life. He says, I've been in plenty and I've been in need. I've been in a position where I was well fed, but I've also been in positions where I was real, real hungry or I had nothing to eat. And the thing that I discovered is that God was with me through all of those circumstances. So guess what? Based on that, I know that God can strengthen me. Listen, this is how you correctly interpret the passage. God can strengthen me to face any situation. I can go broke and still have faith and joy and peace. My situation can go from bad to worse and I can still have joy or peace. 
Trump can win this campaign, this reelection, and I can still have joy and peace. My joy and my peace is not dependent on what's going on outside. It's dependent on my connection with Jesus. Look at what Paul says. He says, I am strengthened by him. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And there's something key there that you can't miss. You can't miss it. And I'm getting ready to close in a few. There's some key in that passage you can't miss. He says, through him who strengthens me. Who is he talking about there? The first idea that would come to mind is Jesus, right? But Paul is very particular in describing the different members of the Godhead throughout his writings. And he does it for a reason, because each member of the Godhead plays a different role in the life of the believer in terms of salvation, in terms of sanctification. And so when Paul says, is referring to him in this passage, He's referring to the same one in Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in me will carry it on until the day of Christ Jesus, which means he's speaking of the father and not the son. And that's important to understand because you do know that the father, according to Jesus's own words, is greater than him. Jesus submits to the father. The father submits to no one. The father submits to no one. It's the father that Paul refers to when he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? As much as the devil tries to flex, first of all, Jesus already won, so he can't even bring it to Jesus, but he dare not come for the father. The father dwells above the heavens where nobody can get to him. As a matter of fact, if the father were to reveal his glory, it would destroy us all. We're talking about the one that you can't even approach. But according to Paul, he says, my life is hidden with Christ in God. Come on now. Paul knew. Paul knew. Paul knew these truths. They weren't just in his head. They were in his heart. Paul knew what was going on. Paul knew that this truth, he didn't just accept it in his head, he believed it with his heart and his faith was strong. KP, there's something going on with the screen, man, you gotta fix it. Paul knew these things on a personal level. You see, we can't just know Jesus like we know LeBron. We gotta know Jesus on an intimate level. We have to know him for ourselves. And spoiler alert, he won. Spoiler alert, the devil lost. Let me tell you a couple of stories to close. You know how I know the devil loses? Not just because in, uh, of scripture. I actually have a personal experience, and I want to share that with you. Some of y'all heard this story before, so just bear with me. The reason why I know for a fact, beyond what the scripture says, that the devil is going to lose is because I asked him personally. And you're probably just like, what, chap? How do you ask the devil personally? Well, when I was young, I was reckless, you know, and I can remember as as a as a teenager, early teen, um, I had a neighbor who lived right next door and they weren't Christian. You know, they, they were nice people. They just weren't Christian. They didn't have faith. Um, so at the time, the parent didn't really know that there's this particular game that they purchased that was not actually a game. It was a spiritual game. And some of y'all heard of this game. Um, you heard of the Ouija board. They actually sell it everywhere. And let me just say a word on that. You better than, don't you ever play that game. I don't want to hear nobody calling me talking about, Chap, I woke up in the middle of the night and there was a TV floating over my head and, and it wasn't even plugged in, but it was on. I'll be like, yo, I'm sorry, bro. Call the Ghostbusters. Don't call me. I'm just, I'm just playing. I'll help you out. I'll pray for you. But don't play that game. I played that game. I was reckless. I was dumb. And I played that game and I was so reckless. I even played it on a Sabbath afternoon at the church. I was so reckless. So I don't know if you know how the game works. I'm not explaining this to you so that it can excite you. Yo, if you've ever played that game, don't ever play it again. And if you have like some kind of app or something on the phone, you better delete that joint because I'm telling you, the devil will come after you, right? So I'm, I'm this teenager, I'm playing this game with these kids and we get there and the way the, the game works is two people got to take their pointer fingers and put it on this little plastic piece. It's just a little cardboard. Um, it's this cardboard, it has a full alphabet on it, then it has the numbers, you know, zero through nine, then it has a yes and a no. 
um, and it has all kinds of occult symbology over it. And there's in the middle of this little plastic piece that you put your fingers on, there's a little magnifying glass and there's nothing in the piece. There's no batteries included, nothing. So the way that you're supposed to play the game is you ask the, the, the game, the board, some questions. You just ask some questions out loud and then y'all put the two fingers on the piece, two people putting their two pointer fingers on the piece and the thing just starts moving. Now, I can tell you from experience because I played the game. That thing started moving by itself. I didn't push it. So we're asking, you know, silly game, silly questions like, oh, who has a crush on who? Am I going to get married and all that stuff? Because, you know, there's a lot of young kids, neighborhood kids, some younger girls, some younger boys. And, you know, what kind of car am I going to drive? Just silly stuff. Right. But me, you know, <laughs> I grew up, I kind of. At a certain age, I think from around like six or seven, I grew up in Adventism. So I knew a little bit about how the world was going to end. I knew something about scripture. So the next day I go back to my friend's house and I'm still curious about this game. I should have stopped playing it right then and there, but I was still curious about it. But it's just me and him now, me and my little friend from next door. And he was younger than me by a couple of years. So I said, yo, let's go play the game again. So we go in the room and man, I got real reckless. I started asking the board some spiritual questions. And one of the questions that I asked the board is, hey, do you know that when Jesus comes back, you're finished? I swear I asked that question. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, do you know? Because I knew the power behind that board, which is why I shouldn't have played it. But I asked the question, do you know that when Jesus comes back, you're finished? Can I tell you that without hesitation, the peace slid to yes? Straight up. The devil knows he lost. He's trying to convince you in your present situation that you're going to lose too. You're not going to lose. You already won. Let me tell you how I know that you won. It's because of the blood. It's because of the blood has given you immunity. So I'm going to end with this story right here because we're pretty much out of time. I remember watching this nature documentary back in the day. Um, and you know how those documentaries can be, man. You, you feel so bad for, for the prey. You know what I'm saying? The predators are out there. And I don't know, sometimes I'm watching these videos and you see the lion or you see the snake and they're going after this cute little animal. And it's like, I don't know about you, but I want I want the cameraman to just put the camera down and go save the animal. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that never happens, of course. They want, it, they want you to see how nature plays out. So there's this one particular um, documentary I'm watching. And there's this cute little chipmunk, you know, it was out in Cali. And so he's going around getting his food. Actually, it was a she, it was a female. She's going around getting her food, foraging through the, the woods and, and looking for food for her babies, right? And then they, they pan in on this rattlesnake, this California rattlesnake. And so the snake is, the narrator starts talking about the snake and how it's waiting there to go after this little squirrel. And of course, the squirrel is, is looking for food and, and, he, and he, as he pans out, you notice that it's getting closer and closer to where the snake is hiding out, it's closer and closer. And of course, as you see in that, I mean, I'm just like, come on, man, just save that poor little thing. Don't let him go down like that. You know, I'm, I'm fearing because I know what's about to happen next. And so sure enough, it gets really close. The snake is there waiting, lunges out and digs its fangs into the little, little squirrel. Or it was a chipmunk, actually, my bad. Digs its fangs into it, puts its venom in it. So the chipmunk runs off and goes back into its little burrow underground. And the snake, all nonchalant and all casual, is not chasing after it, it's moving real slowly. You know why? Because it's waiting for its venom to take effect. So it's just chilling, casually walking, not walking, but crawling. You know what I'm saying? Sliding across the ground. Like, yeah, yeah. Let me just go get my meal. So I don't know how they do it. You know, they do these crazy shots in these nature documentaries. They got the camera underground. And so the camera is underground showing you this little chipmunk's burrow. And then you see the chipmunk is standing in front of his babies. It got a few little babies there. So I'm just like, man, now these babies are going to die too? No, Lord Jesus, help them. <laughs> and I'm watching. And the narrator starts speaking up. So at a certain point, you see the snake come down 
and they caught her on camera. The snake comes down and is looking face to face at this little chipmunk, face to face. And the, the little chipmunk is standing there fearless and the snake is there. And so the narrator speaks up and he says, the snake is waiting for its venom to take effect. And then he, he starts to say, the snake is puzzled because it's wondering why its venom hasn't taken effect yet. But what the snake doesn't know is that over the years, the chipmunk developed a tolerance against the venom, so it's not going to die. Amen, somebody. So you know what happens after that? The little chipmunk turns around and starts kicking dirt at the snake. <laughs> and eventually the snake realizes, oh, this thing is not gonna die. And it turns around and leaves. Can I tell you something? Do you know how anti-venom is developed? The way that anti-venom is developed is you take the venom out of the snake and you use that same venom to develop, to develop the antibody. Can I tell you that Jesus took the venom and he took it into his blood and, and, and he took the effects of that venom so that now he's able to stand here and affect and, and give you the, the, the blood, which is able to counteract the attacks of the enemy. So even though the enemy is able to dig his fangs in us and cause us some pain, he can't take us out. As long as we keep trusting in Jesus and in his blood, despite my performance, despite my situation and whether it changes or not, despite who wins the election, despite whether or not these cops start acting right and stop persecuting cut people of color, despite what goes on in my earth all around me, it does not matter because I keep trusting in the blood. And so yes, with Paul, I say rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice because spoiler alert, I won. I will never lose because I trust in the one who has defeated the enemy. And yes, the father is greater than the son, which is why Paul said that the father exalted the son so that his name is above every name. And at his name, every knee will bow, including the devil and his entire army. They're all gonna bow at the name of Jesus. That's who my faith is in. That's who my trust is in. So I don't care how much longer COVID lasts. I don't care what happens in this country because man cannot determine when Jesus is coming back. I don't care. Trump can't bring Jesus back. Neither can Biden. None of them. It's not up to them. Don't be scared about what they're going to do. Because let me suggest to you that when Jesus gets ready to come back, it doesn't matter who's in office. He's coming back. What's important is whether or not I'm ready. Don't get caught up on what you see around you. Focus on what God is trying to do within you. Spoiler alert, you won. The last thing I'll tell you about my daughter as I close. This is the last one, I promise. So we are watching that same movie and now we watch it a couple of times because you know how kids are. They want to watch the same movie over and over and over and over again. <laughs> So we're watching the movie for, I don't know, second, third time, fourth time, I don't know. And we're sitting there and by this time, I'm not even concerned about whether or not she's spoiling it because I've seen it and now I remember all the scenes. I'm just trying to bond with my daughter. But she does something that's so funny to me, you know, her little five-year-old self. So we're getting up to some of these same fight scenes and we both know what the outcome of the fight is, but she still decides to say, I'm going for this robot. Who do you think she chooses every time? The robot that's gonna win. You know the winner. Don't choose the loser. You already know who wins. Don't believe the lies of the loser. Keep your faith in Jesus. And if you don't know his will for your life, I'll tell you his will for your life right now. This is baseline. His will is to spend more time with you. That's his will for your life right now. Spend more time with him. His will is to develop your prayer life, your devotional life. His will for you is to develop your, your, your Bible study skills. His will for you is to have you in his presence. That Start there. Start there. Don't worry about the future. Deal with today. Spend time with Jesus. Let him develop your faith. Let him strengthen you. Let him prepare you for whatever life brings so that just like Paul, you can say, I can face any situation because God is in me, strengthening me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you.
for telling us the end from the beginning. We know how this story ends. So even though I'm in a scene right now, a part of the story that is dire, that's discouraging, that has me feeling hopeless, the truth is that I can have the peace that surpasses all understanding because because it doesn't matter what I'm going through right now. As difficult as it is, if I just bring it to you, you're able to take my discouragement and give me hope. You're able to take my 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 worry and give me peace. You're able to take whatever it is that I'm feeling and 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 strengthen me through it. Build me up through it. So build us up, God. We need it. Cuz we don't know what's going to happen between over the next 24 hours. We don't know who's going to be president, but our faith is not as in the president. Our faith is in the King of Kings. So develop that faith, strengthen that faith so that we can all stand up in that last day and hear those words from you and make it to heaven, to a place where you will give us everything we want. And we'll have such a great time up there that we'll forget about all of the things we had to go through down there. So preserve us until that day. Keep us, continue to do that good work in us until the day of Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. So yeah, you can check out the chapel, scan that QR code. Um, if not, if you can't scan the QR code, the link is in your Oakwood app. Just open the app and then click on the events, find University Chapel, click on that. You'll see a link in the description. I also put it for those who may not have the Oakwood app. If you scroll to the top of the comments in YouTube, there um, you just look for me, Drew Pelleggi. That's me. I actually put the link there. You probably have to copy and paste it into your browser and it'll take you to the manual check-in. Um, so check out right now. Check out right now. Scan the app. If you don't have the app, click scan with the QR code scanner in the app. If you don't have the the QR scanner, or if you're watching on your phone so you can't come out of this feed, then just go into your app, click on the events tab, look for University Chapel, click on that, and then you'll see the link in your description. All right. Um, and like I said, if you don't even have the Oakwood app, download it right now. And if you're watching on YouTube, go up in the comments, you'll see where I posted a link up there, copy and paste it, you're good to go. All right. Love you, family. Um, we're going to move to closing prayer. All right. What an amazing um, sermon Pastor Pelleggi preached for us. Um, today we're going to close out. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you to tell you thank you. Thank you for this wonderful message, oh God. God, break us to build us up, God. God, I pray that we will rejoice in you in not just our good times, but in our bad times, God, as well, God. God, I pray that you will strengthen us, God, and I pray, pray your protection over us from whatever the enemy has to throw at us, God. God, you own a count of a thousand hills, and you can do anything but fail, and at the end of the day, you win. So help us to walk in that power and that anointing and that favor, knowing that you win at the end of the day. Help us to sh um, have a better devotion life and help us to lean and depend on you because god you are where our help comes from and your son jesus name i pray amen and please don't forget to scan if you again pastor Legi said it don't forget to scan and you guys have a blessed and wonderful day
Hey fam, I see some of you are having trouble signing out. Don't worry about it. If the app didn't let you do it, don't worry about it. Um, I just put the link back in the comments for YouTube. Uh, so you can, you can copy and paste that link if you need to, and then you'll be able to check out. So don't worry about it. If you had a little trouble, you know, we're being real gracious this year. We want you all to get used to the custom, um, to get adjusted to checking in and checking out through the app. But if for some reason you're running into some issues, don't worry. We're not going to, you know what I'm saying? We'll work it out. So don't worry about, oh, am I going to get fined and all that stuff? We're just working the process out. So in situations like this, where it's not working out exactly as, as we want to, and there's some kinks and everything like that, and you're having trouble, we're not gonna penalize you for that. But do your best to do it, because we are recording it. And if you can, leave us a good rating, all right? So God bless y'all, do your best. We'll see you next week.